Welcome to Vintage Americana, exploring and restoring rural American culture. Come visit for more information at vintageamericanapodcast.com. I'm your hostess, Holly, and this is Episode 1, Managing Woodland Resources the Old-Fashioned Way. I live in western Michigan. Much of the entire west part of the state is very Dutch in its character. Most of this is due to a succession of waves of Dutch immigrants. But the best-known group were led by Reverend Van Ralty and established Holland as their settlement. There's a story there. Well, more than one. It's not a story that you'll generally find in the fluffy town histories promoted by either Holland or Pella, Iowa. But it is one you'll find in the book Netherlanders in America by Jacob Van Hinty. According to Van Hinty, Van Ralty and another Dutch pastor named Skolte had intended to bring both of their flocks to America and start a combined settlement. Van Ralty and his people came over first and had originally intended to settle in Wisconsin near Milwaukee. However, they arrived late in the year and this slowed their progress from the East Coast into the hinterlands, which allowed a number of people in Albany and then Detroit and then Grand Rapids, Michigan, to influence Van Ralty's choice. They promoted Michigan as more suitable for the colony. After all, there were already Dutch Reformed congregations in Grand Rapids, and, they pointed out, Milwaukee was filled with Catholics. Yes, I know. But you have to be just a bit familiar with the Spanish conquest of the Dutch, the Inquisition, and the feelings of the Dutch Reformers to understand exactly how effective this sales pitch was. Van Ralty was persuaded to instead take his group to Ottawa County, Michigan, which, like most of West Michigan, was heavily wooded. Skolte, when he heard about the change and received reports of the characteristics of the new settlement, was infuriated. He announced that his people were farmers, not lumberjacks, and instead ended up taking his people to Pella, Iowa. Now, I'm not sure which group ended up getting the better end of the bargain, but I think Van Ralty ended up sort of screwing up in reverse. His group of immigrants was somewhat less wealthy than Skolte's, most of whom had had their own farms in the old country. They didn't have quite the resources, and one thing must be admitted, wood is a resource. Clearing land provided also lots and lots of lumber. Lumber for building, lumber for fences, firewood, wood to make charcoal that could provide heat for kilns, and... Lo and behold, it turned out Van Ralty had chosen a site that had some good clay deposits. The Van Eklossen brothers made bricks from two different clay deposits in two distinctly different colors and led to a local species of houses and buildings incorporated those colored bricks into decorative patterns. They're a beautiful merging of Dutch brickwork and American architecture that led a distinctive flavor to the area. However, Van Ralty's people had such a wealth of timber to use that they, like most colonists, quickly seemed to lose their old-world predecessor skills developed over centuries of managing woodlots. Lumber, after all, is a long-term product. You plant a tree for your son, is the saying. I think we need to bring some of them back. So today I'm going to explore using some very ancient techniques for managing woodland and brushy resources on the homestead. My husband and I have dubbed our property Brambleberry Meadow, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek nod to its extremely overgrown state. So let's jump right into coppicing, pollarding, and hedge laying. I do realize that hedge laying isn't really a woodland management technique, but go with me on this and you'll see how it's related. Next, some clever wag is going to point out that this program is called Vintage Americana, and none of these things were commonly done here. True enough, but I have a few reasons for discussing it anyway. First, coppicing is a truly ancient technique. It goes back to the Mesolithic era. That's right, cats and kittens, people in the Middle Stone Age had worked out that coppicing certain trees was a more reliable and productive way to utilize that particular resource. Second, native people certainly did use coppicing as part of an extensive toolbox of techniques that helped them manage their environment. And third, much of traditional agriculture and woodcraft as practiced in these United States were brought to these shores with the European immigrants. 
they've just fallen by the wayside in the face of such abundance of woodland. All of these are related to ways to manipulate natural tendencies of trees. We're all familiar with pruning, and all we're really talking about here are very specific types of pruning. When you read an article on how to prune a tree, you are manipulating that tree to grow in a specific way. Most modern manuals will talk about pruning back to a bud so that the selected bud grows in the desired direction. Much ink has been expended on the subject of taking care not to create conditions such that the tree doesn't have a designated bud when you make your cuts, or you'll get uncontrolled growth. This is a modern way of viewing pruning, and it isn't the one true way. It's not even the way we've always done things. Because long before we expended our efforts to produce the straightest, finest grain timber, prettiest rose bushes, or best producing apple tree, there was a need to maximize our ability to use other aspects of trees. Coppicing involves cutting young trees off at or near the ground. Trees, like all living things, will do their level best to stay alive. In this case, they'll devote all the energy stored in their roots to making a host of new buds. Now, some trees are better at this than others, so don't go cut down the blue spruce in the backyard with the expectation of a bunch of new Christmas trees for next year. Conifers, in general, don't respond all that well to coppicing. This isn't a hard and fast rule, mind you. In fact, you can grow Christmas trees in a coppice system, but you have to know what you're doing. If this is something on your to-do list, I recommend Carving Out a Living on the Land by Emmett Van Driesch. It's a book that's about 40% how he and his wife have taken over and made a success out of a business doing just that, and 60% more generalized advice on how to make the most effective use of your resources. I recommend it to anybody who has an interest in good stewardship, and Emmett is an excellent steward. Lots of deciduous trees, however, do respond enthusiastically to coppicing. Willows are famous for it, as are hazel and sweet chestnut trees. Elms and ash can be managed this way as well. All of which brings us to the question of why. What is the purpose of coppicing? First, a coppice tree will produce a fresh flush of new growth more quickly than you could expect to get the same volume and thickness of new seedlings. The coppice stool, that's the portion that remains when you cut off the top, already has an established root system, so it can concentrate on growth. The end product of the coppice isn't the largest diameter, straightest timber, but it can provide higher volumes of material, especially if you need smaller sticks to work with. But when you're making everything you use from what you have around you, rather than running down to the big box home improvement store, those small pieces are important. Hazel rods have so many uses, stakes for hedge laying, the matrix for wattle and daub construction, wooden hurdles for fencing, trellises, baskets, and so on. The same is true for willow. Coppiced willow shoots are a prime material for basket weaving. Coppice wood that's gotten a little older and a little larger in diameter makes excellent firewood or charcoal. It can also be used for construction and fence posts. There are a number of ways to manage a coppice forest. One is to divide it into 10 to 15 smaller segments. One segment is cut down each year, then allowed to regrow for 10 to 15 years as each additional segment is cut in its turn. This keeps a constant predictable size and quantity of lumber available. It also creates a continuum of environments that builds biodiversity. Species that do best in young coppice where the sun is plentiful can simply shift from segment to segment as conditions change. In general, a coppice wood is home to many more species than a mature forest. Another system is called coppice with standards. It might even be the predominant system of the two. Here, promising specimens of high-value hardwood are allowed to grow as single on coppice trees, the standards, surrounded by the rest of the coppiced wood. This has a couple of functions. First, it allows the same woodlot space to also produce some quality timber for use in building or for sale. Second, 
the coppice wood can help provide a certain amount of competition for the standards, which helps them to grow straighter with fewer low lateral branches. This makes the standards better quality for lumber. This is actually a more useful idea than the one I got from the forester who walked my property with me. Through no fault of his own, since he was trying to help me with the legacy of some more interesting aspects of the property. Around 30 years ago, the gentleman we brought our property from had planted about three and a half acres in walnut trees, which was a nice idea, even if he didn't realize just how long a term a project he had started. And while most of the trees are decent quality, there are more multiple trunks, crooked trunks, and low branches than I would have preferred. Either they needed to be pruned more regularly when they were young, or they ought to have been interplanted with a faster-growing conifer whose shade would have encouraged straighter upward growth. However, then those conifers would have needed to be selectively removed. Think how much better it would have been to interplant with a species that could be coppiced. Now, I have three and a half acres of walnuts with such a thick undergrowth of things like Russian olive, honeysuckle, berry brambles, and multiflora rose that you can't walk through most of it, especially in the summer. The walnuts don't form a thick canopy, and a coppice would probably have done well enough in the understory. Now, we'll likely have to make use of livestock, maybe goats, to get it clear enough to navigate. Hopefully clear enough to divide up with fencing and eventually run some pigs among the trees. After all, what better use for those black walnuts that fall into such thick underbrush that we never find 95% of them than to finish out some hogs? In fact, grazing livestock amid coppice woodland is another traditional technique. Do you see how all of these things start to mesh together? Each added element increases the yield of the same little parcel of land, while at the same time helping to keep it maintained and even improve it. It's also possible to allow some of the coppice woodland to go ungrazed and get a little overgrown to provide a habitat for game. That isn't something on my list of things to do. My parcel of land is already the local bedroom community for deer. It causes some related issues, including neighbors who've gotten used to treating it like their own personal hunting reserve. We've had to ask a few of them to remove tree stands, trail cams, and bait piles. During the summer, the large deer population also tends to attract coyotes. So, once we move out onto it permanently, we'll want to discourage the current excess deer population from calling our place home. Otherwise, we'll be dealing with excessive competition from them for our garden plants, orchards, and feed for livestock. In fact, one of the disadvantages of a coppice woodland is that the tender young shoots that spring back from the stool when you cut the coppice are extra delicious to both deer and livestock. So those segments of the wood can't be grazed when the coppice is freshly cut. And deer, as any good Midwesterner has cause to know, are relentless about attacking anything edible, especially in the early spring when other food sources are scarce. Which brings us to pollarding. To pollard a tree is to cut it off above the average browsing height of deer or livestock. Then, like coppice trees, it sends out new shoots from the cut. Most pollards are then managed by keeping a limited number of arms and harvesting the wood from each arm separately. That way, the tree has some branches to feed itself, while no one major branch gets too heavy. Once a tree is pollarded, Maintenance is important. Left uncut, the weight of the branches will tend to cause the trunk to split. Because we don't see pollarded trees so much in the States, there is a tendency to regard them as damaged or otherwise abused. But, in truth, well-maintained pollards outlive trees that are allowed to do what trees naturally do. They're much more common in the landscape in Europe and have been for centuries. You can spot them in illuminated manuscripts, in paintings from the 18th and 19th centuries, and in more modern artwork as well. I even saw some in the background when watching Pennyworth. And if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, the Whomping Willow sure looks like it's a pollard. I do wonder who gets close enough to cut it. Sometimes the trimmings from pollards get used in the same way as coppice wood. Firewood, charcoal, building, and so on. Sometimes there are other purposes. Tree hay was a regular use. 
tender young branches were trimmed, tied into bundles, and put in the barn to dry. These bundles make excellent fodder for livestock in the winter, which is yet another good reason to keep those trimmed ends up above the reach of animals. Ash and elm seem to be preferred species, both historically and by the animals, while cherry and black locust are toxic. Tree hay was vital to the survival of Scandinavian farmers and their cattle well into the 20th century. For the ultimate example of using pollards for something other than just firewood and charcoal, pick up Sprout Lands by William Bryant Logan. He talks extensively about guided pollards in the Basque region of Spain. Here, oak trees were pollarded in a very specific way to create a large timber with a bend in it for the shipbuilding industry. Now there's a project that takes knowledge, patience, and a generational view toward management. In fact, anything with trees requires a deep commitment. There are all sorts of aphorisms that point this out. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Or, a man plants an apple tree for his son. He plants a nut tree for his grandson. Both sayings convey the long timeline between planting that seedling and any sort of payoff. Trees are not for those with short attention spans. But coppice and pollards require something more than just the understanding that it will be a while before you see the results of your labors. When you choose to prune a tree in one of these specific methods, you are creating a tree that will need care long after you are gone by someone else who knows how. In a society where it's not unusual for people to move every two to five years, Is it any wonder that we've lost the art form? Heck, I'm still a little sad that the people who bought the house I grew up in tore out the English cottage garden we worked so hard to install and replaced it with grass. Coppicing or pollarding trees involves having a certain faith that someone will come behind you and take up the work. If you go diving into various articles on either practice, You'll see some people getting very excited about the confluence of coppice and pollard resources with quote-unquote commons properties. These tended to be tracts of land that belonged to a village or a community as a whole. This realization is often followed by rather pink and sparkly odes to the delights of communal property and its superiority to the concept of private property. This should immediately tell you that the person waxing rhapsodical didn't look all that hard. While these forest lands were, and sometimes still are, commons, it should be noted that the right to cut so much as a stick from the trees being managed was usually spelled out in a local charter, a rental contract, or considered to be part of the deed to one of the houses. The theory of the common folk is that when people are aware that something is the property of all, they'll be more careful with their management, so as to leave something for their own successors. And that's just not human nature. So, just as in modern times, specific rights and responsibilities were spelled out in order to maintain these very long-term resources. Now that we've delved into the nature of coppice and pollard management, What would it look like on a practical level? Or at least, how do I intend to make use of these strategies? I think for my purposes, I'm likely to plant and then coppice some willow and hazel. Willow has all sorts of uses to a small farmstead, from basketry to making your own rooting hormone. Willow also tends to be both tolerant of and inclined to improve wet areas so there might be some reason to treat a few of them as pollards while letting them dry out some of the wetter sections of the land. I'd rather not, after all, have a fully grown weeping willow. While a beautiful tree, they're not very strong and have a bad habit of coming down in windstorms. Hazels have the dual purpose of producing nuts and also nice straight coppice limbs. Hazel rods will be useful for laying a hedge, more on that in just a few minutes, Hazelnuts are delicious if you can beat the squirrels to them. And the growth habits of hazel will mean incorporating quite a bit of it into that hedge, too. Pollards are, in a way, more of an intentional approach to silviculture, which is just a fancy word for the deliberate growing and use of trees. Tuck this one into your vocabulary bucket. Whenever you hear the prefix silvo, 
we're talking about trees and forest. I think there are two places they may be useful on our farmstead. The first I already mentioned, willows. It's entirely possible that the need to move dirt around when the house and barns are built will leave a small pond in one corner of the property. With two autistic kids and two dogs, I'm not super fond of this idea. Even though it won't likely be very deep, the potential for mess is high. So I may take a leaf from the Dutch and ring it with a fence made of willow pollards. To do that, we'll plant willow trees around the pond at four to six foot intervals, then fill the space between the trunks with woven willow. This means the willows do double duty. The trunks are the fence posts, while the tops provide the willow withies with which to weave the fence. And I may have just made up my first tongue twister. The other place that I can think where pollards would fit neatly into the landscape will be in the pasture. I'd already intended to develop that resource as a silvopasture. I have a neighbor who's already done that for his flock of Shetland sheep. A light covering of trees within the pasture keeps everybody cooler in the summer and protected from the worst of the weather that howls off the big lake in the winter. But since I've already got quite a lot of tree cover, I don't want the entire parcel to be thickly wooded. So I can either choose a smaller sort of tree, which looks like what my neighbor has done. I can't quite tell from the outside of the pasture what sort of trees they are, and I have yet to get the nerve to go knock on his door and ask. Or I can pollard the trees to prevent them from creating a dense canopy that would impede the growth of grass and forbs beneath them. Guess which one I'm planning to do? Yep, pollards. That will allow me to take advantage of the ability to make tree hay in addition to using the tree's physical presence to my advantage. Now, ash and elm, the two preferred species for tree hay, both have some issues in my neck of the woods. Ash, locally, has been beset by the emerald ash borer. The venerable old ash trees have largely succumbed. Our property has a decent stand of younger ash trees, maybe 20 to 30 years old. When we first bought the property, I asked the forester I mentioned earlier, who works for County Extension, to come and walk the property with me and give me some advice. I asked him if I should cut down those ash trees. In his opinion, I should not. We're well past trying to control the spread of the borer. And if these trees have some degree of resistance, which does seem to be the case, they may serve as a genetic basis for recovery of the ash tree. Which means I'm probably going to be transplanting young seedlings around my own property rather than buying any ash seedlings whose degree of resistance to the borer would be a mystery. Elms are a little easier since their main scourge, Dutch elm disease, has been a threat for quite a lot longer, which means there are more resistant varieties of the tree commercially available. One last thing to take into account will be planting the elm trees in the section of the pasture nearer to and abutting the walnut plantation. Black walnuts secrete a compound called jungalone into the soil which inhibits the growth of many plants. Not the noxious ones apparently, but a lot of them. This helps cut down on competition for the walnut trees, but it makes growing other things around them a little challenging. Elm trees are pretty tolerant of black walnuts, ash trees less so. So now you've got the basics of coppice and pollard management and how I'm planning to use them. Maybe you've even been inspired with some ideas on how to make use of them yourself. Now let's talk about hedges. And I don't mean the trimmed boxwood hedges that separate houses in 1960s sitcoms. I mean a genuine laid hedge. A living fence that can be built to be bull strong and hog tight. For most of us, we think of the patchwork of English countryside divided up into little fields stretching on as far as the eye can see. Some of these hedges even date back to 800 AD. We don't often regard hedges as an American thing. But early in our history, the practice of quick hedges was brought over with the colonists and used to good effect. Here, for instance, is a quote from a letter Charles Wilson Peale wrote to his son, describing a farm in Pennsylvania. I visited Job Roberts the day before yesterday. His farm is a model of excellence in the culture. 
He is growing several hedges, which in less than seven years will be complete fences against all sorts of cattle. The management of which is a good lesson, which I hope to make useful to this place. Then barbed wire was invented, and it was simply faster and more economical in the short run to string it across vast tracts of land. And in fairness, lots of hedges in Britain were ripped out to provide larger, more open parcels that could be more efficiently worked with mechanical equipment. While I'm a fan of electric netting, solar chargers, and the wonders of managed intensive grazing, there is still a place in this world, and on my farmstead, for a traditional laid hedge. The construction of a hedge, from scratch, involves planting a double row of species of woody plants that seem most amenable to the project. They should be sturdy, suited to the climate, and if at least a proportion of them have some thorns, it will further discourage livestock from pushing through. Once those plants grow up a decent height and thickness, they are cut at the ground, but not entirely through, just enough to lay the entire plant nearly horizontal. Then the next plant is laid on top, in continual fashion, down the line of the hedge. Stakes are used at intervals, and extra rods of supple wood are often woven across the top to keep everything neat, tidy, and contained. Over time, the cut portions of the trees and shrubs heal and send up new vertical shoots. These hedges do require maintenance. They need to be trimmed every few years and relayed on a regular basis as well. So, like a pollard, planting a hedge is an exercise in faith. The faith that someone will come along behind you and appreciate your effort, and then commit to continuing on. Hedges also accumulate. Over time, more species of plants colonize the hedge. Berry brambles spring up along with all sorts of leafy plants. Small birds and mammals find it a sheltered place to make a home. Larger animals find it a handy source of snacks. What might otherwise be more or less unused edges of our parcel have the potential to instead be a rich repository of biodiversity. And at the same time, it will give an extra layer of containment for livestock that might like to roam, something my neighbors are unlikely to appreciate. Now, since this is an American hedge, I would like to keep things more tilted to native species. It just makes sense that plants already adapted to the environment will thrive, without getting entirely out of hand. So far, I'm planning to use some American hazel, hawthorn, serviceberry, chokecherry, viburnum, winterberry, and dogwood. I may also sneak in a few apple trees, likely crab varieties, and maybe a few standards. That is, an occasional stem meant to be left to grow as a tree that will be inside the hedge surrounded by it. Perhaps a maple or beech. The utter lack of oaks on my property or my neighbors suggests that oaks don't like the conditions here and I might be better not to try those. I should mention, as something of an aside, that there is evidence that the oldest hedges were both laid tightly to contain livestock and had some stems that were not laid but were coppiced or pollarded for firewood. By the opening of the 20th century, cheap coal had made firewood much less important to the Brits. So they continued to lay the hedges, but stopped coppicing them. Whereas on the continent, firewood was dear, but the methods of raising livestock changed enough so that it wasn't worth maintaining hedges for stock. So, in Brittany, for example, hedges weren't laid, but continued to be coppiced. Over time, they became more linear copses of firewood-producing coppice stools that no longer functioned as hedges at all. Now, I don't know yet how much firewood we'll have a use for. Between the Swedish tile stove, the fireplace on the porch, and a planned sugar shack, perhaps it's best to think ahead and tuck a few seedlings that will be useful for that purpose into it when I plant. I'd wanted to try to get the hedge planted this spring, but I'm having a bit of trouble sourcing everything I want. While my county and the counties that surround it all have seedling sales run by their respective conservation district each spring, nobody seems to have more than a couple of the species I'm looking for. So I'll keep hunting around for a nursery that sells in quantity and has what I need. Once it's planted, it's likely to take five years or a little longer for it to grow up enough to be laid for the first time. Then what? Well, 
Hopefully by then I'll have a chance to have learned the basics of laying a hedge. Jim Jones, who is currently working with the University of Waterloo in Canada, has started something called the North American Hedge Laying Society. He had a workshop planned in northern Michigan last year that was canceled, and I'm hoping that it gets rescheduled. Or, if I'm really lucky, maybe I can get him to come and do a workshop here and lay the hedge as part of the lesson. We'll just have to see how things go. In the meantime, I've managed to acquire my very own billhook, which is something between a hatchet and a machete. It's the traditional tool for hedge laying, and I've already found it useful for dealing with some of the stiffer brush. It's good practice, so that by the time I go to work on the hedge, I'll have enough accuracy to leave just the right amount of each stem before I push it down to horizontal. Today, we've spent quite a lot of time talking about some atypical, but very traditional methods of managing woodland resources that integrates them more tightly into the farmstead environment than just a woodlot at the back of the property wood. Thinking about coppice, pollard, and hedge laying techniques only really makes sense if you're approaching them from the perspective of producing and making more of the things you need right on your own property. Whether that's firewood, charcoal, baskets, tool handles, or a jar of jam from foraged hedgerow fruit, you have to value these things to see the point of managing the resources that provide them. But Frugality and using what is at hand are definitely part of the rural American tradition. Today, we've also spent our time talking about something quite concrete and hands-on. Perhaps next time we'll talk about something a little more nebulous. Stories and why they're important. In the meantime, if you like what you're hearing, please leave me a review and share this with your friends. You can find more Vintage Americana at VintageAmericanaPodcast.com. That's where you'll also find some more detailed show notes, links to some interesting books and articles, and more information to help you explore and restore rural American culture. I'm going out to practice more with my billhook and see if I can clear out a little space under the old apple tree. Are you coming? Are you coming?